Good evening and welcome to this live stream. It's 8 o'clock in Sydney and it's 6 o'clock in Perth. I'm Tom Rabbock. I'm a journalist, author uh, of a book called Rorts and Ripoffs. We're going to go through with Lisa Gregg, a tax expert tonight, looking at all of the issues you need to worry about in relation to doing your tax return. It can be a complex time, so over the next hour, Lisa and I are going to explore a range of issues that will simplify a whole range of things. Lisa, thanks for joining me this evening. Absolute pleasure, Tom. We've got nothing better to do, even though Melbourne is not in lockdown. Oh, we're we're, uh, we're doing this in solidarity with everyone in Sydney, of course, Absolutely. and Brisbane and anywhere else where they might be in lockdown. Now, it, one of the most critical issues for us at the moment is actually un for people to understand what precisely... Um, we're talking about here, and I think it might be useful to start with talking about the deadline people need to meet. I mean, people people can organise their lives around weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals, dates at the movies, um, and, and whatever have you, gym appointments, hairdresser appointments. Compliance is the same. So what are the deadlines people need to worry about, Lisa? Well, you're talking about getting your 2021 tax return in, Tom, I think. So we're talking about the year that ended 30 June, which was Wednesday of last week. Absolutely. And so now we've, we've got a requirement to lodge a tax return, which we have to do yearly as individual taxpayers like we are. So if we earn some money, we usually have to lodge a tax return. And in doing so, if you're going to lodge yourself, through MyGov, et cetera, uh, you've got till the 31st of October when you need to do it. If you're going to use a tax agent like myself and a lot of my colleagues out there um, who like to assist you to get the right information to the ATO in the right time, um, you've got to the 15th of May usually. It depends, but most of the time um, if you go through it through a tax agent, you've got till the 15th of May. So, Tom, what I like saying is, Get your tax return in early if you think the ATO owe you money, but if you owe the ATO money, come and see us and we can lodge it as late as the 15th of May because you don't have to pay until after you lodge. Okay. Now, there are some tricky things for people who are involved in self-assessment. Their deadline is October 31, which we've just said. So what are the tricky things that um, impact on the way in which people lodge their uh, lodge their tax return what can go wrong yeah so we're talking about self lodges here so we've got an interest so so we can lodge it as an agent for you or self lodges so you can lodge your own and i think the tricky thing is is timing because everyone when someone doesn't want to do something there's two, there's two schools of thought isn't there tom people want to get it done quickly and out the way or they procrastinate and want to, and do it at the deadline Right. So a lot of people want, might want and think they're going to get money. Like, you know, we talk about the $1,080 that's, that's the perpetual temporary offset that's available. OK. Yeah. But, what, but what I think people have to realise is that we've got this, the, the tax office uh, receive a lot, a lot of data to do with our income, pretty much all our income. So you think about the income that you know the viewers have have have, have collected throughout the, the the 12 months they've received salary and wages they've received dividends they've received interest they've received maybe income from the from the gig economy or something like that the ato's got really sophisticated data data um, collection vehicles and it all comes in so you've got to wait till all that information comes in. So if you try and lodge your tax return too early, all that data might not have come in yet. So the ATA always always will match what you've lodged with the data they've got available to them and go, mm, please explain why haven't you included this bit of bank interest or why have you forgotten your third or fourth or fifth job um, with what you've been doing? So this is where if you do things too early, you might not have all the information, even the best record keeping. You could forget about a bank account that you closed way back when and it's got a dollar worth of interest that's going to cause the ATA to go, mm, mismatch, I think you need to pay tax on that extra dollar of income. I think the there was someone on Twitter earlier today who basically admitted to having 
some money that didn't make it to the ATO's portal, they lodge the return, and then subsequent to lodging the return, they get an amended assessment and the ATO comes along and says, you owe us $1,000. Is that common out there? If you try and do things too early, Tom, it, it, it could be that way. Like the ATO have already said, I think it's either the 5th or the 7th of July, they're not going to start processing returns till then. And usually, especially at busy times, it'll take at least a week to process. So say at the earliest, if you're expecting a refund, it's, it's, it's mid-July at the absolute earliest. Okay, now if we think about what happens now, because as I said, there's everything's digital, everything's online, right? It's very hard to do things, you know, on paper now. So what we used to get in the old days, because you and I are about the same vintage, we used to have get things called group certificates, if you remember. They used to be on carbon paper. So the viewers out there that are probably, you know, born in born in, in this century don't know what we're talking about. But we used to call them group certificates. So the payroll office would give us a form and said, this is how much salary you've earned for the year and this is how much withholding. You should take this this form and that's how what you use to do your tax return. Now, as we've progressed... Everything is now electronic. So just about everyone now is on what we call single touch payroll. So these forms get automatically generated. So instead of getting a bit of paper or even an email from, from your payroll, um, it goes into either your MyGov account or uh, me as a tax agent can see it for my clients, right? And what happens is payroll has to, what we say, finalise it. So all your pays go through the system and then after 30 June or for your last pay for the year, some some have already gone through, some will still yet to go through, um, you, you basically generate what we call an income statement now. So the group certificate is now called an income statement and it's all online. So you've got to wait till that's finalised. So what I do when I lodge a return, I check that this form is finalised. I can see it written down. If someone's using their MyGov account, you want to wait till it's finalised. That means that payroll has done everything and said all the adjustments are there. How And that should be done. It's usually the middle of July it's meant to be done, but because of COVID, the ATO has given us a little bit of grace or the payroll office is a little bit of grace till the end of July. Um, to basically finalise. Now, of course, you could be working for an employer that doesn't quite get all their compliance activities all set to go. So you've got to work out whether your your income statement's finalised or not. As I said, it's meant to be done by end July. So if you lodge too early before that's all finalised, there could be adjustments. So therefore, your tax return that you've prepared won't match what the ATO data is. Okay, let's just recap that briefly. Just because you think you're going to get money back, don't rush in a hurry because you need all of the information uh, on your ATO portal, irrespective of whether you're using a tax agent or not. Now, the, sometimes people get a bit confused with the terminology we use in the accounting world. So it's probably useful to, to dive into some of that so they know what they're actually lodging and preparing and whatever have you. Um Income is the magic sort of word. Um, we can refer to it as successful income in the tax world. Uh, how do we define it? Well, yeah, we sort of, we talk, it's very interesting because what we actually pay tax on is what we call our taxable income. But our taxable income is really our tax profit. So this is where the tax laws get confusing, even with their terminology, Tom, as we know. So we've got accessible income, and then allowable deductions. So the income is everything that you bring in that's accessible, which includes a lot of government payments, which people don't realise. And then any expenses, so anything that you spend, any deduct, so deductions, expenses, whatever word you want me to use, that, sh that you spend and don't get reimbursed by your employer because that's important, that you can substantiate, which is another word we need to qualify. So you got a receipt for basically. Um, mm -hmm. that, that goes against earning your accessible income. So let's say your salary and wages income, right? You can deduct that and then you come up with your taxable income and that's what you pay pay tax on. So but basically you you're, anything that comes in related to things you do, whether it's your salary, whether it's gig economy stuff, whether it's... Um, you know, investment income. If you've got a bank account, for example, there's interest. 
uh, if you've got income from sort of shares and everything else, all of that comes into that one big pot, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And the interesting thing, so people go, I want, I want to get a deduct. I want to get some a refund for tax, for example. So what you need to think about when you're doing your tax return, and it's it's good, your salary and wages have tax taken out as you go, called pay as you go withholding, right? So if you earn earn a hundred dollars worth of salary and wages, there could be twenty, twenty five, thirty dollars worth of tax that's taken out. So you only get seventy, right? Which is which is fantastic. However, if you get interest or you get dividends or you get um, gig economy type income, sometimes the tax hasn't been taken out of that. So you might have to pay additional tax on that, right? Then when you get your deductions, you hope your deductions will mean that the, that the tax that's been taken out of your salary is a little bit more than what you really have to pay at the end of the year and you get a little bit of a refund back. But the pay-as-you-go withholding system, which is the tax taken out on your salary, should work out to be roughly the tax you pay for the year. So that's how it's meant to work, Tom, anyway, in the grand scheme of things. Now, one of the things we need to look at, obviously, is tricky expense claims. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a, and, and yeah, please don't do this at home. Only people who are tax advisors can give you tax advice. We saw some interesting tweets about, you know, piling on laundry costs and cents per kilometre and all that sort of stuff. So I want to thank people on Twitter for giving us the case study because we're going to work through it now. Um, let, let, let's deal with laundry because it seems to be one that some people can claim and other people can, can't. So what, what happens when you've got laundry, for example? Yeah, I think some of these, these just just going back a little bit, Tom, some of the things that people claim, um, they're saying you claim up to a certain amount of money without a receipt really is what they're saying, right? So laundry is one of those ones where you're talking to someone about the around the water cooler or grabbing a coffee or, or at the pub about what you can claim for laundry, right? So they're basically saying if you use clothes specifically to your job, if I can call it that, where you're earning accessible income, as we talked about before, um, you can claim the wa the washing machine for that, right? Basically, the, the, the electricity usage is what we're talking about, right? But it's not just anything you wear, right? If something, what the, one of the rules of thumb that I talk about um, is that if you can tell the occupation of someone when they walk down the street by what they're wearing, there's a good chance that the laundry on that, those clothing or the or the dry cleaning on that clothing, um, you'll be able to claim. Protect, protective clothing also, especially under COVID, you know, scrubs, for example, let's use COVID-friendly stuff, but anything protective as well. Or if it's got a logo on it. So say you work for a fast food franchise or something and you have to wear something that's got a logo on it, you might be able to claim the laundry. If you're if you're just wearing normal street clothes, no, it's private. Okay, so that's trying to work out what type of clothing you could potentially play la claim laundry on. Now, everyone's probably heard you claim up to hundred and fifty dollars, right? So everyone just puts hundred and fifty. However, you've still got to justify that it makes sense, right? So how do you work it out? So the numbers you need are this. You can claim $1 a load if it's just for that clothing. Or if it's a mixed load, you can claim $0.50 cents a load. Now, how many weeks in the year have we got? 52. However, the ATO do this really interesting thing if, it, if you ever get audited, they go, you're allowed four weeks and you'll leave, aren't you? So you can't use 52 weeks. You only use 48 because if you use 52, even if you don't take the annual leave, it usually gets knocked back to 48. So then you need to work out how many loads a week you're going to do. So, Tom, we can do this on the top of our head, just roughly 48. Say we do three loads, isolated loads of $1. That gives us just under the 150 all right, so that's roughly how the numbers work. However, you've got to think about it as well. Like if you're just washing your fast food franchise outfit and it doesn't smell terribly of oil or whatever, 
right? It's probably likely you're going to throw it in with your gym gear and everything else. The AGA is going to look at it and go, you're not going to watch that by itself. You're going to wash that in a mixed load. So instead of claiming a dollar, they're going to say, I'm sure you've claimed this as a mixed load, so it's 50 cents. So this is the kind of thing that goes on when the ATO is going to audit anyone or review anyone's laundry claims. Because as we know, $150, if you just claim a straight $150, how does it get? Yes, Tom's got a calculator there. What if you worked it out to be? So this is roughly how it is. 40, 40, 40, 48 weeks, if you're only washing it once a week and it's in, in a mixed load, it's $24. There you go, Tom. It's, and then that is the deduction you take. Thanks, Tom. Pretty yeah, cool. that's the deduction you take. That's what the, the deduction you take. And then, of course, that's not the actual money you've saved. It's the tax on that money that you've saved as well. So we're talking about really a cup of coffee, aren't we, really? Ultimately, yeah. I mean, cents per kilometre came up in that Twitter post. So I really should thank those folks on Twitter again. Twitter can be useful sometimes. So how does all this car stuff work? I don't oh. drive... I'm clueless. Okay. Yeah, okay, Tom. We wait just just a bit just about just about driving. We drive on the left and yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> this is always an interesting one, right? Because when I was working for an employer and I had to drive anything for work, I would put in an expense claim and get the money back. Right? If that's the case, you've been reimbursed for it. You're not going to claim anything. Now, the cents per kilometre method of, of, of claiming motor vehicle for work purposes or for earning your accessible income, being your salary and wages, this is another one that everyone talks about because it's sort of like you don't need to do anything for it, right? So what they're saying is, for 5,000 kilometres, is the theory is, for 5,000 kilometres you can claim with no what we call logbook. So they're saying, oh, we don't have to keep a lot of paperwork. And for the year we've, we, we've just done, it's 72 cents. For the year before that, it was 68 cents. And you look at it and go, well, that's nothing like, I just f filled up my car today, it was nearly $2 a litre for, for 98 octane um, petrol. So what so the idea is is that you don't need a logbook so you don't need to monitor everything you know and, and document things however you've still got to justify that it makes sense so you've got to make sure that it's for work purposes right and you've also got to make sure you can justify that it makes sense via diary entry or something like that okay now yeah. what people have to realize is from home to work is private, pretty much, right? Then if you're at your job and you have to go visit another client or you need to go, you're, you know, out of COVID, we're talking about, right? If Or if you have to go and do some, you know, um, a course that's related to your job or everything like that and then drive home from somewhere that isn't, isn't your work, you can claim those mileages, right? Or if you're at work and you've got to do run an errand for work and come back to work, you can claim those kilometres, okay? Providing you're not reimbursed. Now, home to work can also be business if you're carrying bulky equipment. And the rule of thumb there is if you can't cart what you're doing on public transport, it's considered bulky, a sort of the rule of thumb people think about using, okay? So that's another thing where you can potentially get home to work as, um, as, as a business expense, if we want to call it that, or an employment type expense. So this is where it comes down to. So what you can't do is say 5,000 kilometres is the limit I can claim during this method, 72 cents, get your calculator out again, Tommy, and go... 5,000 times 72, that's the maximum claim you can make. But just because you can do that without a lot of, like, log books and things like that and receipts and all that sort of thing, people think you've just got a right to claim it. It's what we call under the substantiation exemption type, type expenses. 
but it's still got to make sense. You've still got to have some sort of diary entry. You've still got to say, well, I've right. travelled from X to Y and it's going to be some distance to do that. Right. It's still got to make sense. Now, in COVID times, we haven't travelled as much. So the ATR are expecting a lot of those claims to be a lot less because we've had a whole year of COVID. Last year when we were doing the 2020 tax returns, we had like three months only. So it sort of wasn't as a bigger impost. But the okay. HR have already said we're expecting those things to be a lot less. Sorry, Tom. Uh, now, but what you're really saying is it's a bit like Jerry Maguire. The ATO just wants you to show them the money, right? Well, show that you've you've considered the money maybe. Well, yeah, you, well you, if you have you I'll spent it, that. right? I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. Yeah, okay. Now, All right. Now, Show, show, me the show me the documentation. That doesn't sound as sexy, though, does it? No, it doesn't. Now, um, <laughs> now work-related education expenses. Mm -hmm. now, there are those who talk about this as being um, just education expenses. It's right. That's wrong, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 one of those things that gets a little bit tricky in the tax return. So there's two there's two item codes D4 and D5. D4 is self education expenses and D5 is work related expenses. Okay, and it's important to to understand the differences. What are what, what are the differences between the two items? So we're talking for self education, we're really talking about a course done at a tertiary institution like an MBA or something like that, right? However, what happens with that? There's a part of the tax law that says you can't claim the first $250. Now, the budget announcement in May, we had a budget in May, which was lovely. We were back in on the normal cycle, said they're going to, um, that the government's going to pass legislation to get rid of that $250 so you can claim the lot. Okay, but that's not going to happen for a couple of years, so don't worry about that. But that's the self-education. So that's what we're talking about. And it can't be a, a government-subsidised place, and there's a few other rules around that. But what I'm talking, let's let's talk about, you know, a master's or uh, um, an MBA or something like that would be common for that. So that's the D4 one. So you usually don't see too much there. What usually happens is continuing professional development. Now, whatever profession you're in or whatever what whatever you're doing, there's those courses that you've got to do to keep your currency, to keep being competent in your job. Now, that goes under the D5 deduction, which is work-related expenses, okay. right? So if you go and do a course somewhere, you do something online, but it's got the course has got to be relevant to your current role. So the idea is that the deductions have to be against, so your allowable deductions has got to be against your assessable income, as we call it. Right, it's got to be related to your current role. So, if I wanted to go off and do a barista's course because I really like coffee, well, if I'm not making money uh, as a barista, I can't claim that deduction, right? Okay. And it's got to be your link. current role. Okay. Yep. So the link is coming back to the basis of deductions. Uh, it, it, the, the, any deductions you claim must be related with what you do for work. Education is no exception. Correct. Now, there's been a lot of stuff happening with um, coronavirus of late, as we have noted. Notice uh, coronavirus capers, particularly working from home. We're going to see a lot of this flow through tax returns and people are going to be wondering what they can do and what they can't. What are you seeing at the moment flow through in terms of the training you're doing for accounting bodies? What are, what are people asking questions about? Yeah, th this is the interesting one because this is something that it's a good news story and it gets caught by mainstream ma media a lot, Tom, and um, we've had conversations about this as well. So the ATO say if you're working from home, which means you're earning accessible income, we should give you some work from home deductions for it, for the use of your power, your electricity and things like that, a bit like the washing, so the use of your of the electricity and, and the wear and tear on your washing machine, let's okay. do the same thing from working from home. Now, there's a number of different rates, right, and these rates change. So there's what we call the $0.52 cents per hour rate and the 
80 cents per hour rate. And because this has gone up, this 80 cents hour gets caught um, getting discussed in general media as well, right? Because it's the COVID rate, okay? So we're saying that you can claim 52 cents an hour for working from home or 80 cents an hour for working from home. And so everyone goes, you're guilty, 80 cents, let's take that. However, of course, the ATO have given you what we call an easier, a fast track method with the 80 cents. They've tried to make it easy for people because there's people that have worked from home from the very, for the very, very first time because of COVID, because we've been forced to work from home in a lot of cases. Okay. So my feeling is this with the, with the 80 cent rate is that if you've been forced to work from home because of COVID and you're not used to claiming any work, work from home deductions, um, in your tax return, that's the one that you might think is, is, is a better one because the big difference between the 52 and the 80 really is you don't need a dedicated work area for the 80 cents. So this is where the ATO has given us a little bit of liberty with what we can claim and what we can't claim, right? So we can have all family members, as this is my analogy, all family members sitting on the couch with their laptops watching Netflix, which of course they're not going to do at the same time, right? All claiming this 50, uh, this 82, 80 cents per hour rate. However, it's got to be, but then we've got to go, well, what's the, di what diary, keep a diary for how many hours you've worked. You know, are you normally working a 37 and a half, 40 hour week? Are you just working three days a week or whatever? So you, so you can claim that that way, Tom. Now, you can't claim anything else if you claim the 80 cents. And this is why I'm saying if you're not used to working from home, you want to claim the 80 cents. It seems like a nice little shortcut to do, right? So you normally work work in the office. You've decided your employer and because of COVID, you've got to work from home, 80 cents. With the 52 cents, the people that have been claiming work from home deductions all the time are used to this. It used to be 48 and it just sort of goes up as electricity and gas and everything goes up. Now, with the 52 cents an hour method, you have to have a dedicated hour, a dedicated place at home to work. The dining room table or the couch is not going to cut it, okay? However, if you use the 52 cents, you can also claim your... Uh, your business percentage or your work percentage of internet usage. You can also claim the the uh, employer or business usage of laptop computers, desktop computers, printers, go down to, you know, the office works and grab things. You can claim all those sort of things as well, okay? So this is where I'm saying that if you don't normally claim work from home deductions, the 80 cents works a lot easier because you don't need to keep any other records of how you're going to work out your your business versus private proportion of, say, your internet expenses, which you have to do as well. So this is, you can see this is a bit, little bit of complicated area as, as well, that you've got a lot of apportioning, as we say, between private and business with a lot of these expenses. And that's why if you're not sure or you're not sure what records you need to keep, you're better off coming to a tax agent because we can make sure, one, um, that you're claiming the right amount, you've got the right apportionment and you've got the right documentation to support your deductions. Now that's um, that's actually sums up uh, aspects of working from home. But what we what we haven't spoken about is the sort of the quirky bits in terms of working from home. What you're able to claim. I mean, the the classic case is are you able to claim Tim Tams? Oh <laughs> yes, that's got caught up with mainstream media as well. So no. Is the basic answer from home, okay? So there's things that we basically call, let me call it sustenance is the word that's used. So food. Yeah, you mean food. You just, yeah. No, go for it, Tom. Yeah. You mean food, stuff we eat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about our tea, our coffee, all that sort of thing. If you're working from home, you can't claim it. However, what happens, your employer can call it staff amenities and then they can claim it, right? So that's why you, why there's different rules for business as opposed to us individuals. So there's little quirks of the tax system based on that. 
so they can claim so you, the business can claim it as a staff amenity right providing it's eaten on the premises yeah right so basically go go do the order eat your tim tams provide your coffee tea milk juice whatever you want there but at home totally different sustenance and that's the difference between us being individuals and the business being a business no matter what structure they're in yeah it's it, it's actually an interesting dilemma because if you're eating tim tams at work it it's supplied by the offices, part of the the environment you're in, and all of that. Um, but you can't you can't claim it yourself, and yet you're not in the office, sponging off the yeah. boss of Tim Tam supply. Yeah, and it's exactly the same, actually, Tom. As if your boss takes you out to a cafe and buys your coffee, can't claim it. But if the coffee was on the premises, you can. Right, and it's just little quirks of the tax law that people just don't quite appreciate. So, you know, if in doubt, you know, we've done all the studies to make sure that we know what we're doing sort of thing, right? And the thing is, right, we're in a self-assessment. Everyone self-assesses their tax return, right? Whether you get us to do it or you to do it, you're still saying, yep, this is what I, this is what I think I can claim. Right? It's not until the ATO start looking at you and go, okay, justify this, that you go, oh, okay. Now, what is there? 11, 12 million individual taxpayers, I think, Tom, last count. There could be more now, but roughly that. The ATO can't check everyone. So it's a matter of them looking at all the data and going, oh, this looks a bit odd. Let me come and ask you a few more questions. And if the ATO come knocking, again, Tom, I wouldn't be worried. You just need to go back to them. Don't put your head at the sand. I think a lot of people that get themselves into a little bit of a spot of bother with the tax office goes, oh, I'm scared. I don't know what I've done. I just panic, right? But no, just get on the front foot. They're just normal people. I have love. I spoke to a lovely lady and who was who was who was working from home in Townsville this week. And I said, Oh, how is it all going? I was just changing someone's name from their maiden name to their married name. And it's not that they, they they're human. So just Enter into the dialogue. Honestly, the worst thing you can do with the tax office if they have a please explain letter is for you to basically throw it on the bottom of the to-do list and ignore it. That's when you can start getting yourself into a little bit of hot water with them. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's actually quite problematic. I mean, back in um, back in the day when I dealt with the various tax type issues and ethical issues in with previous employers, uh, it's kind of interesting to observe what you see from the point of view of, well, not just clients ringing up, having a, wanting to find out what, what a treatment is, but or whether their accountants got it right or whether the fees are correct, which, by the way, if we, if we just touch on this for a moment, if you've got an issue with fees and, account, and accountants, that's not something an accounting body can deal with, you know, a body like CANS. Chartered Accountants or CPA Australia or Institute of Public Accountants. Lisa and I are members of, I'm a member of one, you're a member of at least two. Aren't yep, you? two. Yeah, she's a yeah. member of two. As, um, well, as, as, well, as well as a professional tax body, specialist tax body as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there are a range of things you need to be conscious of when you're looking at whether an accountant has done the right or wrong thing by you if you're using an advisor. Um, it's important to remember that fees are not an area that the bodies are going to be looking at um, in terms of misconduct, uh, and nor will the uh, Tax Practitioners Board. We'll touch on the TPB a little later on just to mm -hmm. let people know what they need to be looking for. But one of the topics at the moment, though, Lisa, is actually um, one of the ones where people might have thought they could get away with blue murder with tax, and that is... Cryptocurrency. Um, so we're talking here. We're talking about digital currency, the stuff people go around and say they mine. Um, it might not have the same environmental impact as Matt Canavan's coal adventures, but <laughs> it, it it does have some consequences for people in terms of taxation. So, uh, Lisa, when we're talking about Bitcoin and all that type of stuff. What are the issues that are coming up? I know you've been talking about it. I've written about it in the past. Yeah. It's really it's really tricky. 
But what are the what are the key issues that are cropping up that people who are playing with cryptocurrency uh, need to know about? Yeah, playing is a good word, Tom. Um, and I think that more people are getting involved in it because, like, interest rates are, are really low at the moment as well. And they can see, um, like, I, I, the Bitcoin exchange and things like that is, is is getting in mainstream media. And I think a lot of people like it as well because it's always been the bastion of um, illegal activities. So they think they're under the radar or in the black economy or in, in, in the black part of the internet, which I'm sure you know more, much more about than me. But people think that it's just anonymous and everything like that. However, as I was mentioning before, the ATO get a lot of data. Guess what? The, the, the platform technology, so the wallet data, that they get that information as well. Okay, so what's been happening? Now, the ATO quite a few years ago said this is our position on cryptocurrency. It's not a currency. It's, a, it's what we call a digital asset. So it's treated like an asset. So if, you, if you're if used to dealing with shares, we, we treat the tax consequences a lot like the shares, but the share that doesn't give you any dividends if you get my drift, okay? So we treat it like that. But the ATO now get a lot of data from these organisations as well. So as well as all the all the share transactions and all the banks that, that talk about um, interest and things like that, they're getting information about cryptocurrency transactions, right? So think of it like a share. So, But it's a bit more complex than that because what uh, people that deal in cryptocurrency do, they seem to go, I'll buy some Bitcoin, then I'll buy some Ethereum, and then I'll buy some Dogecoin, or then I'll go back or whatever. So instead of buying some crypto and then converting it back into our fiat currency, our, our Australian dollars, they'll just swap it for another currency and off we go, right? Now, each time you swap it for a currency, as I said, it's like a share, so each one's a digital capital asset. Every time you swap it for another currency, you're triggering a potential capital gain or a capital loss, all right? So if you want to think about it like shares that a lot of people understand a little bit better, it's like you've bought Telstra and then you've swapped it for BHP and then you've swapped it for Rio and then you've swapped it for West Farmers as you go, all right? Each one of those is a separate transaction. So not only do the ATO know that you're playing in this space now because the data's coming in, it's actually quite complex to get the get the maths right, if I can call it that, because each time you do a transaction, we've got we can only pay tax in Australian dollars, Tom. We can't we can't pay tax in Bitcoin. Last I looked, I don't think the ATO will accept that, right? So each time you do a transaction, at that point in time, and I mean real time because we know that there's a lot of fluctuations with cryptocurrency, at that point in time, we've got to work out what the Australian dollar equivalent is and work out whether you've made a gain or a loss. So it's really quite complex. Uh, and, of course, these exchanges or the platforms or the wallets or whatever you want to call it, the ones that actually enable you to transact in digital currency, cryptocurrency, right, they're not set up to report correctly for the Australian tax office like you know, your your um, stockbroking firms are. So it makes it very difficult. And just for example, there was letters that went out to a lot of taxpayers at the beginning of the year saying, we think you've got digital currency. I think you better make sure that you lodge your tax return correctly. So for those taxpayers that use us, like people like myself as a tax agent, they didn't have to lodge till the 15th of May. So then the tax return was lodged, and guess what? The ATO is starting to query some of those clients to make sure the maths is right so they know it's happening, right? A lot of times our clients think we don't need to worry about it till it comes back into our bank account. But because, as I said to you, each time we transact, it can be a, a taxing point, either a capital gain or a capital loss, we've got to know about it. So it's really quite complex. And it fluctuates a lot, so there can be a lot of people that are making a lot of money or a big loss. So we've got to bank it somehow or other. Now, you, you can – the interesting thing with this is um, there, there are people out there who are involved in financial crime who use Bitcoin to ship things around, uh, uh, as a different as a proxy for cash, um, 
and might use other means as well, which are well documented as also, whether it be you know, money laundering after uh, engaging in business email scams and whatever have you. But it's it kind of, you know, moving to use a sporting analogy, it, it can be seen by some people as moving off the fairway and into the rough, but the thing is, it'll get get taken to the fair back to the fairway by the ATO one way or another. Yeah, I sort of think about it. the digital currency is now caught up with sort of like the cash economy and things like that as well. Like even if you're dealing cash, you know, you may think that no one knows about it, but there's still some sort of audit digital trail about it. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, my feeling for for the current tax season is we're not going to be seeing as much businesses you know, dealing in cash because we've had to tap because of COVID and things like that. But it's it's exactly the same same sort of thing where um, it's very, very hard now to um, evade those sort of um, experiences because the data, there's a data trail, there's digital breadcrumbs, whatever you want to call it, Tom. I mean, your, your book brought some riff ops. You've looked at a lot of those sort of things that, um, you know, I, I really think, that the cryptocurrency discussion has now put some light on on what data is available to, for governments, which is really what we're talk, talking about. It's all of government that the ATO can see. They can see their own little patch, but they can also see what happens with Austrack or Fair Work or whatever as well. So it's all hitting to the, the regime that even though crypto meant to be sort of for illegal activities, well, even if it's illegal activities, you still got to pay tax on it. You know that's the way the rules work. Uh, the one thing that I do want to do in the time that we have left is actually talk a bit about uh, advisors and mm-hmm. how people can identify an advisor. Now, an advisor for tax purposes is not the guy on Twitter that says you really need to be claiming something or I I claim something and I appear appear to have gotten away with it. That's not what an advisor is. Um, But what what I'll do now is show the the viewers where they can go um, to have a look at things. What we have here um, is a website of the Tax Practitioners Board. I'll enlarge it briefly. Uh, you'll still be able to hear Lisa and I while we're doing that. Uh, the Tax Practitioners Board is the authority that deals with um, the registration, uh, the, the monitoring and disciplining of tax agents. So when you go and look for a tax agent, you need to consider looking at the tax agent register, you might be able to, what you'll see in a moment is a register. Now, you can actually take the time, the key details in. You can you can look at it. You can key in a state. You can key in a suburb. You can key in a person's name. That will enable you to see how many tax agents that are registered that actually work in a particular area. It will also enable you to see how the um, whether someone's actually re- registered or been disciplined or been struck off. And that's really, really important in today's, uh, today's environment when we've got people who are concerned about the quality of advice that we received. The previous book I wrote called Vulture City looked at, the, looked at financial advisors and how financial advisors were misbehaving and in some cases um, operating criminal cartels within a financial institution, not even with the knowledge of their employers, in order to uh, get get to money out of the sort of commissions and um, kickbacks that, that were on offer for, for loans and that kind of thing. So you need to be sure that you're using the right kind of person. Now, Lisa, the registered tax agent, so she's able to tell us precisely what happens uh, to someone who's a registered tax agent, what does the Tax Practitioners Board expect of you as a person who's a tax agent? Well, yes, Tom. Um, BAS agents and tax agents are all monitored by the Tax Practitioners Board, as you said, and we have a code of conduct that we have to um, uphold to make sure that we are 
professionally competent and uh, those 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 sort of things uh, to do that. And we have to reach a certain education level to do it. And then we also have to make sure that we're current by undertaking a minimum number of hours a year in terms of knowing what's happening with tax law. Because you know, as I mentioned before, we had a budget. Every, the, the tax laws are changing all the time. And that's really important in terms of making sure that uh, we know exactly what you can or can't claim or or how different transactions are processed from an Australian tax law point of view. It's interesting when you reflect on it that way. I mean, there are uh, ethical obligations now. But earlier on, I mentioned that there are people who are Sort of members of professional bodies, I call it the sort of the rabbit top five things you need to do when you're looking at uh, getting a tax agent. You look for a professional body. Um, that somebody got a membership of a professional body. They've got minimum minimal minimum qualifications. But that's not all. I'm a member of a professional body, but I can't give personal tax advice. I can write about it generally. I can um, look at it from a journalistic standpoint. Uh, I can, uh, you know, do sessions like this, but I can't give you specific advice for a fee because that's not the game I'm in. So, secondly, um, you look for whether someone's got a practising certificate. Lisa's a member of two bodies. She's got PI insurance, that is professional indemnity insurance, and she must have it to run, a, run an accounting practice. I don't run an accounting practice. So I don't have professional indemnity insurance on that front uh, because I don't do that sort of work. Thirdly, is the person appropriately registered? Okay? So what you've got to do is look up a website like the Tax Practitioners Board site, which we, um, which we talked about earlier. Key in the details, investigate whether or not someone's qualified and registered and do uh, do what you can with that particular uh, particular tool to satisfy yourself. The other thing you'll want to do, of course, is uh, if you're looking for someone to provide you with advice, you, you do a bit of research yourself on the subject matter. So you walk into a room and actually ask some meaningful questions. You know, talk to someone with a bit bit of knowledge uh, behind you, so you can see whether they. Uh, they They'll, they'll be a good fit. The other thing as well, if you've got people who are um, who use the tax agent, friends or family, and they've got someone who's quite reliable, uh, you might want to entertain talking to that person. And lastly, guess what? You're under no obligation to take that advice um, you know, or that advisor on. If you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel you can trust that person with your financial details and, and all of that kind of thing, you don't need to do that. You can look for others. So the Tax Practitioners Board website is useful for that particular information. In fact, um, Lisa mentioned the book Boris and Ripoffs earlier. I've got a chapter in that uh, talking, to people, talking about how to select an appropriate advisor. I mean, I think it, you know, that's kind of uh, an important thing that people need to remember. Yeah, I think what's also important, Tom, is that um, someone like myself will ask questions of the individual as well, right? So we'll be, I'll be asking questions about, um, you know, what do you do? There'll be some qualifying questions, it's a bit like going on a date, if you want to call it that, right? I need to get to know my clients to know uh, what their tax profile's like, and then that gives me an idea of what what deductions I can claim and I'll be asking for substantiation and all those sort of things. Like I'm never going to ask for a password to get into bank accounts or to your MyGov account or anything like that because anything that I that I need, I can either get via the tax uh, the, the ATO or um or from yourselves. Okay, so this so that's the difference. If anyone's going to ask, oh, I need your password to get into anything, that should ring alarm bells and warning bells with that. And it's not going to be an easy street if you come and talk to someone like myself. It's not going to be, yeah, 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 we can claim everything. I mean, that's 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 a bit of a worry because just remember this: it's a self-assessment system. What you saw in your tax return is you say that it's true and correct. Okay, so I see that. 
You have to tell me the right amount of information, the correct amount of information, and you have to make sure that you've got the proof to support that, okay? And I make sure the tax treatment's correct, right? So it's very much a two-way street with it all. But just please be wary of, especially this time of year, there's a lot of people around that will offer you know, really good deals to do things and, and, and that sort of thing. And just if they start asking for more information that you feel comfortable with, you've got a right to be a bit cautious with that, especially with password words and logons and logins and things like that, right? And I will basically send someone a tax return to either e-sign or whatever, um, and I'm not, I can't lodge until you've signed it. So it's a mutual agreement between both of us that say, yep, you've given me everything, you've got proof of everything, and I have prepared it correct in terms, terms of tax law, and that's really important. That's actually uh, a really, really good point, Lisa, and I think we need to, uh, to, to reinforce that. Uh, coming back to coming back to the sort of basic uh, basics of what we're looking at, the deadline, uh, which people have seen scrolling at the bottom, of course, but um, the deadline for people to lodge their tax return if they're self-assessing is October 31. Remember that, and you can plan your compliance horizon. If I can use the word horizon in this context and not in the in the context of our vaccination process for COVID, but and your a tax agent will have to May fifteen the following year. Remember that income, what comes in, um, needs to be accounted for, and then you've got expenses that you've incurred getting that income. Uh, your income minus the expenses then leads to. Accessible income, what you're going to pay tax on. So be careful what you claim. Um, there's possibly one other thing that we need to touch on briefly before we close, Lisa, which is there's a creature in the tax law called windfall gain. Mm -hmm. And people occasionally hear about windfall gain. Um, how do we define it? Because from time to time, people will get winnings. Um, they might win something on lotto. What happens? That's what a windfall gain is. It's basically per chance. You haven't used your skills, expertise, profession, abilities, in effect. Um, there's, it's sort of, there's, there's an element of chance about it, if I can put it that way, Tom. So you basically put a ticket in the lotto and if you win the million, good on you. That's, that's free money. Um, you win the cash cow, for want of a better term, free money. Um, I went on a game show and won some money, even though you could say that's a bit of a skill, but it's it's common knowledge, it's still a game of chance, right? So, um, you know, you win, it, it's all free money. Uh, when you go to the casino, oh, maybe gambling's a good one as well, right? So you basically go to the track when you could, you go and, you go and have a punt on, on, on the four, our four-legged horses. Uh, if you win, you don't have to pay money on it. If you if you lose, you don't get a tax deduction for it as well. So I always yeah. laugh when people say, I won money on the horses. I go, you only hear about the wins, you don't hear about the losses. So that's what we're talking about. So yeah, if you you've had you've had you've had a bit of a win somewhere on a scratchy or something, because you've had a spare couple of bucks. Yep. I'm happy for that to be totally win full gain. Well done. Enjoy. Because Usually with getting these things, you've spent a lot more money than more, what you've got out of it. I think uh, people who take their same numbers of the lotto ticket every week have probably, uh, probably got enough to uh, at least put a deposit on a car or a car for that, isn't it, Tom? Oh, absolutely. Um, now, but just briefly, I mean, we mentioned a book I wrote that deals with advisors and other things called Rorts and Ripoffs. Hope you can get it from... Uh, Wilkinson Publishing, uh, .com .au. that's the book there. Uh, it's also available in electronic copy, which for those who are on a budget is a bit cheaper, but it's a Kindle uh, version uh, with Amazon and also an iBooks version for your Apple uh, Apple device. Uh, so we're, but that's uh, certainly something people may want to have a bit of a look at uh, if they want to understand more about the tax law tax advisors and other other things in that context. 
Um, and that brings us to a close of this inaugural live stream with Lisa and I on, on tax issues. We look forward to doing one of these again in the not-too-distant future, possibly on, a, on another topic that's um, not all-encompassing and perhaps, you know, let, let me know on uh, my Twitter account or, or by any of the other means I've got on my Twitter profile what you'd like, a, like, like us to talk about and we'll, we're will we more than happy to oblige, aren't we, Lisa? Yeah, I've got nothing better to do on a Saturday night, Tom. Sauce me from watching the footy, but it's all right. <laughs> Always <laughs> yeah. a pleasure, Tommy. Always a pleasure talking with you. Okay. And thank you very much for joining me, Lisa, and thank those of you who've been watching the well, watching the stream um, and those of you who will catch up with it later because this will be recorded uh, on both YouTube and Facebook. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Have a pleasant evening. Enjoy your weekend. And no doubt we'll see you again fairly soon. Cheers.